Thank you so much, Pastor. It's a privilege and a joy for me to be here. Uh, this is my last Sunday to be in the Philippines on this trip. Um, I'm planning to come back, and I think the Lord has saved the best for last, okay? Um, <clears throat> this is my last uh, time to preach here. I've been here for almost three weeks, and my heart has been warmed and blessed and encouraged, um, <clears throat> and my wife wants me to come back home. My wife is from the province in Cebu, uh, way down in the southern part, uh, down there in Allegria, and we have a church there. We uh, started a church there many, many years ago. Um, <clears throat> my wife was the first person in her family to become a Christian, okay? And like many of you, she was raised Catholic. And, um, but she found the Lord, and uh, here, here's the exciting thing. More than 30 of her family members have accepted Christ since she was saved, okay? And uh, she actually got saved in the U United States. Um, she told me was, she was saved before we got married, otherwise I wouldn't have married her, right? <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, uh, we were sitting in church one Sunday morning, and during the invitation, we were in a church that still gave invitations. You know, a lot of, a lot of churches have stopped, okay? And uh, I, I would not want to be a part of a church that didn't give a gospel an invitation, okay? So don't ever stop that, all right? Um, but anyway, she went forward, and uh, I said to her, well, what happened to you? She said, I got saved. And the first thing she did was call one of my sisters and uh, told her, them, I just got saved, Mary, I just got saved. That's how you can tell. If somebody got saved, they're going to be telling other people about it. And uh, so we were on our way to come back to the Philippines. And as, as the pastor said, uh, we have a, a boy named Ryan <coughs> together. We made him together with the Lord, okay? And uh, he's 19 now. He's going to be 20 in January. He's still single, girls. Um, I think if I bring him back here, I'm going to bring him to this church, okay? <laughs> I know. I see, I see some, a lot of pretty ladies sitting out there. I, I was thinking about my son. You know, I thought, man, uh, I got to get him back over here. Um, <clears throat> he's doing his college work, okay? And gets all that college work done. I'll bring him back. Uh, we lived here for four years when he, he took first, second, and third grade here in the Philippines, my wife. We came back so she could become a nurse. And uh, I knew that someday I was going to get old. And uh, I'm not dumb, okay? I knew that, I, I know that old people sometimes need nurses to take care of them, see? So I'm, I'm thinking ahead. I said, I got, we got to get you uh, some nursing, tra nursing training. So I have, my, I have my own wife, nurse, and, uh, and she takes good care of me. Last, it's okay if I chat a little bit uh, before I preach. Um, I, I, I'm going to share with you in a, in a few minutes the greatest truth in the Bible that took me, it took me 40 years to learn, okay, and I almost share that with you this morning, the, the thing that, that I just couldn't get it, I just couldn't understand it, and I want to share it with you this morning, uh, but anyway, uh, we, we came back here for her nursing training, and uh, she became a nurse, she's, she's nursing now, uh, practicing nursing in the U.S., but in January of 2021, on a Monday, on, it was her day off, and we were walking around one of the resorts. I live in a resort town, okay? Uh, the, the main industry where I live is uh, tourists, tourism. I live in Las, have you ever heard of Las Vegas? Uh, okay, I live in, and someone said, you live in Sin City. Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, I live in Sin City, Las Vegas. Uh, Cebu is Sin City, all right? 
Every city I've ever been in uh, is Sin City. Okay? But anyway, we were um, walking around in one of the resorts uh, on her day off. She likes to do that. And I'm sitting uh, on a chair waiting for her. And all of a sudden, I feel myself slipping out of the chair into unconsciousness. I find myself on the floor, not knowing what happened. My, my mind was dazed. Two security guards picked me up, set me back in my chair. I couldn't talk. Finally, my wife found, found me sitting in this chair, and it took me a while to recognize her. But anyway, to make a long story short, I had a stroke. January 10, 2021. I couldn't speak for two or three days. Okay. And the thing that worried me the most was I'll never be able to preach again. Oh, Lord. I can't preach again. But the Lord slowly gave me my, my speech back, and my wife, the, the, nurse, the nursing training kicked in, and she does this. How many, uh, how many fingers am I holding? You know, and I, I said, I understand, okay. Uh, but the Lord's been good to me uh, and gave me a wife who is a nurse. That's not the greatest thing about her. She loves the Lord. And uh, so that's my little bit of history about me. And I'm so glad to be here and share this Sunday morning service with you and, and the founding pastor uh, of this good church. And this is a good crowd. You're going to outgrow uh, this, this, this building right here. I feel the excitement of the Lord here. Uh, uh, the piano player, the, the choir, uh, all of it has been a blessing to me. So I, so I go back home on Tuesday, I will remember you, I'll remember this church, and you'll be in my, on my prayer list, okay? Um, this morning, I want to talk to you about righteous sinners, Righteous sinners. Now, sometimes we don't put those two words together. Righteous simply means right standing with God, okay? But when you become a Christian, when you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you become a righteous sinner, or even better, you are a righteous saint. Okay? The Apostle Paul wrote 13 books of our New Testament. If you include Hebrews, and I think most of us agree that the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. So, 13 books by the Apostle Paul, did you know that every one of them begins with a greeting to the saints? It doesn't say to the sinners in Philippi or to the sinners in Ephesus. It's always to the saints, okay? So... We need to think of ourselves as being righteous saints. It was hard for me to put all this together. I was raised in a in Covenant Reformed Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. My parents were what we call Calvinists, okay? And they're very mixed up about salvation, okay? And I, I, really, I really didn't understand uh, salvation until I was 18 years of age when, I found, when my parents got saved and got into a Bible-believing, Spirit-filled Baptist church and I got on the, under the sound of the Word of God 
that I became a Christian. Okay, I found out that I was not in the covenant. Okay, that I had to personally accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. Okay, and that was in the month of August of 1958. Okay, if you have your Bible, turn. I'd like to give you. I I, I gave a bunch of scriptures to our the gals over here handle this. Okay, and I probably won't get to all of them. Okay. Because Pastor told me there's a trap door here, and if I go past 45 minutes, this trap door will open and I will disappear, <laughs> and I will be gone forever. So I don't want that to happen. No, he did not. Uh, he said, our people like and enjoy good preaching, so just preach, okay? Um, anyway, uh, would you stand for a moment? in honor of reading the Word of God, and uh, I'll, I'll give you other scriptures, but I want Romans chapter 4 and verse 1 through 8. Romans chapter... This is a foundation for this simple little message on righteous saints. Righteous saints, okay? Because the Apostle Paul talks about that in these verses. As a matter of fact, there is one verse in these eight verses that, in my opinion, okay, my opinion is the most important verse in the Bible. Now, it's not the most popular, okay? The most popular verse in the Bible is John 3.16, right? Everybody knows John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But, in my opinion... In these verses, especially verse 5, is the most important verse in the Bible. Because everything in a nutshell is in Romans 4, verse 5. If you have un unsafe friends, take them to Romans 4, verse 5. Okay? Catholic friends, um, whoever, bring them to Romans 4, 5. It's so plain, so simple. Romans chapter 4, verse 1. Righteous saints. Here the Bible says, What shall we say then? That Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found. For if Abraham was justified, big word, I'm going to mention it in a moment. If Abraham were justified by works, he whereof hath to glory, but not before God. Verse 3, For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that, verse 4, Now to him that worketh, is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. All right, here's verse 5. I love this. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man, blessed is the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, those whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not Tell me that next word. Impute sin. Okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for making it so plain and so clear how that we can be saved and knowing for sure that we're on our way to heaven. If there anyone here today that is not sure, May this be the day of their salvation. We pray in Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake, amen. You may be seated. 
if you were if you were to go out and today the first 10 people that you meet at the mall or wherever you are and you ask them this simple question what have what do I have to do to be sure that I'm going to heaven what are they going to tell you most of them most people are going to answer that question this way you got to be good you want to go to heaven you have to be good okay we even we even sing about that at Christmas time okay um, the, the Santa Claus song you know oh you better watch out you better not pout you better not cry I'm telling you why Santa Claus is coming to town he knows when you're sleeping now I don't like that okay I don't want in anybody in my bedroom at night when I'm sleeping okay he knows when you're awake he knows when you're bad and good so be good for goodness sakes you see it's it's in our mind it's in our training we have to be good and so the world thinks this way if you have a scale and you have all your good works over here in the scale and your bad stuff over here your sin your good deeds here and your bad deeds deeds here and if the scale tips in your in your favor in other words if you have more good things and good deeds going on in your life than you have bad things you're gonna make it to heaven okay but that's what the world thinks that's not what the Bible says I a number a couple of years ago I was preaching down in the state of Florida and there was a lady in the service that was very troubled and when the service was over she asked me if she could talk to me and I said if you ask the pastor if we can all talk together I was a guest speaker there I wasn't the pastor I said I, I, I have time we'll do that so after the service we met together the pastor myself and this lady she was crying and she said to me she said I was raised in a Christian home I'm not a Christian my parents are Christians and then she said this she said I'm dying she was about 35 years of age she said I'm dying and I said what are you dying from she said I'm dying from AIDS I have AIDS but she said that's not what's killing me I'm not dying because of AIDS she said I'm dying from the shame and the guilt and the condemnation I said why is that and she said because everyone knows how you get AIDS I'm so ashamed of myself and I believe in that moment the Lord gave me the words I needed to say to that lady and I said to her is that the worst thing you've ever done and she looked at me and she said yeah pretty bad isn't it having sex with somebody that you don't know and you're not married to and you get a disease she said that's bad enough I said that's not the worst thing you've done 
She said, what could be worse than that? I said, you killed the Son of God. Your sin and my sin, we killed the Son of God. It was our sin, my sin, your sin, the sin of the world that put Jesus on the cross. We sang about it a moment ago. And when Jesus died on the cross, he died for not just my sin, but he died for the sins of the world were put on our lovely Lord Jesus Christ. He bore our sin. He paid for my past sins. He paid for my present sins. He paid for my future sins. Now that future sins thing kind of, I didn't understand that. All of my sin, past, present, future, how could it be? The sins that I have not yet committed, Jesus paid for those. He died for those. Let me remind you this morning that when Jesus died, all of your sin was future. All right, let's think about that for a moment, okay? It was all future. He forgave us from all of our sin, future sin, past sin, present sin. But yet there are people, even Christian people, that I meet all the time who haven't forgiven themselves. They think about their past and, they, and, they're, and they're held hostage till their past. Living in a guilt and shame and in a, in a performance oriented world. I began one day to think about all my sins. Some, some of these things I thought of and, and had on my mind before I even became a Christian. The Bible says... The, the thought of foolishness is sin. My Sunday school teacher, when I was in the fifth grade, Sunday school class in, at my church, at the Covenant Reformed Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan, said this. He said, boys, if you die with one unconfessed sin, in your life, you will go to hell. That haunted me. You need to be careful what you teach children. It scared me. I began to think when he said that, and, and a, a quite famous preacher said one time, that unconfessed sin is unforgiven sin. I don't believe that either. And the reason I don't believe that is because every person sitting in this church service this morning has unconfessed sin somewhere in your past. Because sometimes we sin and we don't even know we're sinning. Would you agree with that? We don't even know. And we forget. Okay, and so my Sunday school teacher said to solve that problem so you don't have any unconfessed sin in your life, when you sin, immediately confess it to the Lord so you don't forget it. Okay. Now that's hard to do. I can remember being on the football field in high school playing football and, uh, and, and some, some, somebody would play dirty or hit, hit you hard and... And uh, sometimes I would, you know, curse under my breath. You know, you, you know, I'm not going to say the word, 
because I don't swear, you know. And then immediately I would think, oh, oh, oh I, you're not supposed to take the Lord's name in vain. And so they're on the football field on my knees, you know, dear Lord, forgive me. Oh, Lord, Lord, I shouldn't have said that. I'm sorry. You know, my, listen, that's a horrible way to live. Is that true? Unconfessed sin is unforgiven sin? The Bible says in James that if we break one of the Ten Commandments, we broke them all. How many of you here this morning have broken at least one of the Ten Commandments? Could I see your hand? Come on. Everybody's hand better go up or you'll be lying. The Bible, that's one of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not lie. Okay. We're all sinners. We all, look, the Bible says if you break one of the ten, you broke all ten of them. The Bible also says for him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, it is what? Sin. In the past week, is there something good that you should have done that you didn't do? I'm going to be okay. I love to sweat when I preach. Amen. Sure. We're sinners. But one wonderful, wonderful truth is, even though we sin and sometimes we don't know we sinned and we forget, the Bible says we are justified. These verses that I just read you, Paul said, and by the way, if you want to see the Apostle Paul's struggle, just read Romans chapter 7. The Apostle Paul, that probably, uh, without a doubt, aside from Jesus Christ, the greatest Christian who ever lived since Jesus was the Apostle Paul. But when you study Romans chapter 7, the Apostle Paul is dealing with this sin thing. And he said, the things that I should do, I don't do. And the things that I shouldn't do, those are the things that I do. The Apostle Paul said that. Read it yourself, Romans chapter 7. He said, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver, deliver me from this body of death? As a matter of fact, in one time in the scripture, the Apostle Paul said he was the chiefest of sinners. So if you're here this morning and you're, you think you're too bad to be saved, the worst sinner's already been saved. That was the Apostle Paul. He said, in the sin department, I'm number one. <laughs> I'm the chiefest of sinners. But here in Romans, this chapter, he's talking about that word justified. The word justified means this, and you'll be able to remember this. Long after I have gone back to America and you go on with your Christian life, I want you to remember this. Justified, you can take the word itself and, spay, and you can speak out the meaning of the word justified, okay? Just if I'd sin. Just if I'd never sinned. That's what righteous means. Just if when God looks at you and when God looks at me, it is, and you're saved, it is just if you had never committed even one sin. How many sins have you committed in your life? I tried to answer that question myself several years ago. I'm talking to myself and I'm saying, how many sins? 
have I committed? When I turned 82, I got my calculator, calculator out and I, I was thinking like this. See if you agree with me. Possibly three per day. Things when I should have done something, there are people yesterday I should have helped and I didn't help them. You see, you see what I'm saying? The thought of foolishness is sin. I have, I have fo foolish thoughts a lot. So I'm thinking maybe throughout my life I have committed three sins a day. Okay? On my 82nd birthday, I got my calculator out. And three sins a day is 90,885. And I'll tell you something, you got a lot of them too. Some of you, some of you out sitting there are thinking about, oh, what a big sinner you are. Yeah, you too. We're all sinners. How many you got? I got 90 at, at three a day, and I think that's a conservative number, okay? I think I'm being conservative. And, and look, for, I'm not making light of sin, okay? Um, I, I'm not. But it's something we all deal with because when you got saved, we're body, soul, and spirit. Uh, your, your body didn't get saved. Your soul and spirit got saved, okay? The part of you that didn't get saved is your flesh, okay? And that's why at the rapture, we're going to get a new body, okay? Right now, we got to put up with the one that we got, okay? And it's a sinful body. And that's what Paul talks about in Romans chapter 7, okay? So I got 90,890. I'm working at 100,000 now. Possibly, okay? And, 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 I, and I, I know people say, well, uh, you're making light of sin. And no, no I'm not, okay? Because it, it, it's serious. But that's what forgiveness is about. Paul said, we're justified. Justified very simply meaning that we are just as if we have never sinned. And when you get to the end of Romans chapter 7, and you can study this on your own later, you, we come to Romans 8. And I don't have time to take you there right now, but you can go there yourself. And the Apostle Paul, after bearing his soul and telling us about his struggle that he has with sin, he comes to Romans chapter 8, and verse 1, and he says these beautiful words, There is now, therefore, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There is now no condemnation. That means judgment. There is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. You notice, that, you notice how many times Paul uses that phrase, in Christ Jesus. I am in Christ Jesus, and Christ Jesus is in me. Are you, are, are you in Christ Jesus this morning? Have you accepted him as your Savior? If you have, he lives inside of you. I don't want to sin. I hate sin. I don't like sin. But I am a sinner. But I am a righteous sinner. Because Jesus lives inside of me. The second word that I call to your attention is another big word. And that's the word after justification is the word sanctification. The word sanctification, okay? And here's the, way it, here, here's the way it is. I have been justified. August of 1958, I was justified. 
in the sight of God just as if I'd never sinned. You got it. Okay. At that very moment, I also started the beginning of what is called sanctification. Sanctification is that process that happens in the life of a, of a new believer where God is transforming you into somebody that's like his son. Sanctification is the growing process. Some people grow faster than others. Some people get saved and immediately they, they you know, their life gets all cleaned up and all of a sudden, I mean, and they, and they, and they, it, it's a quick process. But for most of us, it's a process that takes time. From the end of Malachi until the book of Matthew, there is a period there that Bible scholars talk about the silence of God. From the end of Malachi until Matthew chapter 3, for 400 years, God did not speak. The silence of God. 400 years. And when I heard that, I said, I want to find out what God said. <laughs> After 400 years, whatever God said, it must have been really important. And so when you get to Matthew chapter 3, where Jesus was baptized, the Bible says that God attended the baptism of his son Jesus. And the Bible, remember the Bible says the Spirit of God descended like a dove when Jesus came up out of the water. And God said this, Behold, this is my beloved Son. Behold, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. God said, I am so happy with my son Jesus that I'm going to make all of my children just like him. That's called sanctification. He's making us like his son Jesus. We're in the process of becoming like Jesus. We shine like... I, I felt this morning when I walked into this church and I heard the singing, all of a sudden I felt like I'm in the, I'm in the presence of Jesus. I am. Because this is his body. The church is his body. We are sanctified. First of all, justified. We are sanctified. And Paul says, There is now therefore no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. But I want you to look quickly at 2 Corinthians 5.21. One more verse. Quickly, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 21. If you have your Bible, turn to it. Um, I'll read it for you. This is one of my all-time favorites also on this subject of righteous sinners, righteous saints. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. Oh, I love this verse. For he hath made him, that's Jesus, who knew no sin, that we, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God, look, 
God does not look at me through my sin. He looks at me through his son. You got to get that. It was so hard for me to learn that. Growing up in a legalistic background and being taught that one unconfessed sin and I'm going to burn in hell forever, it haunted me. It kept me awake at night. And it was so wrong. It's so far against the scripture. You see, friends, God knew everything about you before he saved you. So stop looking in the rearview mirror. Quit looking at your past. God does not care about your past. Your past is forgiven. God doesn't care about it. It's gone. We're in the process of sanctification. Becoming like Jesus Christ. That's my goal. I want people to think about Jesus when they're around me. I want to be a little picture of Jesus. And that's what Paul is saying here in 2 Corinthians 5.21. Maybe the second most important verse in the Bible. For he who who knew no sin became sin. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. There was a mayor in the city of New York. He was, he was quite a character. His name was LaGuardia. If you ever fly into New York, you're going to fly into the LaGuardia airport named after Mayor LaGuardia. Actually, he was a judge before he became mayor in civil court. And a man came into Judge LaGuardia's courtroom when he was a judge. The man's crime was stealing bread. He stole some bread. And he didn't steal money. He didn't steal jewelry. He couldn't find a job. It was during the Great Depression time. It was hard to find work. It's still wrong to steal, but he stole bread so he could feed his children. He's in Judge LaGuardia's courtroom. And Judge LaGuardia reached the fine was $25. Judge LaGuardia reached into his own pocket and pulled out $25 and paid his fine. And then he turned around and he fined the city of New York for creating conditions in the city where this man could not find a job. And he fined the court or the city of New York a hundred dollars. And then he took up a collection in the courtroom and got another twenty-five dollars. And the man walked out of the courtroom with his crime forgiven and paid for with $150 in his pocket. Now, if you don't understand that, that's a picture of grace. That is a picture of grace. I'm standing before God in God's courtroom. I'm guilty. And Jesus... The righteous judge paid my fine and paid for my sin and forgave all my sin, past, present, and future. Matthew chapter 1. One more scripture. Matthew chapter 1. Most of the time, when we read this passage, Matthew chapter 1, it is 
usually a Christmas type of a message. But Matthew chapter 1, I was just noticing this one day. I've been, I'd been reading Matthew chapter 1. And normally, when I, when I read by my Bible through, where's, where's Ryan at? The preacher buddy, your, your little preacher buddy, where's your... Okay, Ryan's read the Bible through a couple times already. Praise Christian. When I read my Bible through, there's certain places in my Bible that I skip. I'm sorry, Lord. Sometimes, and you know what it is? I skip the Beatitudes. Not the Beatitudes, I'm sorry. The, the uh, so-and-so begat. The begats. I like, I like, I skip the begats, okay? Because it's boring. It's boring. Do any, any of you want to go home yet? I'm almost finished. I just noticed it the other day. If you have your Bible, look at Matthew chapter 1. This is so good. And it, and so I usually skip most of Matthew 1 because the book of the generation of Jesus Christ the son of David the son of Abraham verse 1 Abraham begat Isaac Isaac begat Jacob Jacob begat Judas and his brethren and it's begat 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 <laughs> until you get to verse 6 and Jesse begat David, the king. And David, the king, begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. You know her name, don't you? That was Bathsheba. King David. You know the story. David was supposed to be out at war. And he's in his palace and he looks down on the street below and Bathsheba's taking a bath. And it was not uncommon in that day and Bathsheba thought David was gone to war. Where he should have been with his soldier. You know the story. David said, send by, some, someone down to get her, bring her up there. So David, the man after God's own heart, right? I got news for you, he's a sinner. First thing he does, he commits adultery. Then she's got to, he's got to cover his sin. So what does he do? He brings her husband home from the war and tells his commander, um, put, him, put, uh, put him on the front lines. Uriah. That was his name. And Uriah said, no, no. I, I want to see my wife. And David thinks, man, I'm in trouble now. He doesn't want to go home. So I'm, I'm not going to be able to cover my sin because she's expecting a child, right? And so he tells his, uh, his housekeepers, get him drunk. Uriah, get him drunk. Maybe he'll go home. Uriah was such a good soldier, he slept at the door, the doorstep. I'm not making this up, folks. He said, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go in and see my wife. There's a, there's a war going on, man. So he sobers up and he goes back to battle. So here, David commits adultery as a child born out of wedlock. Tries to get her husband drunk. So he sends him back and says to his captain, put him on the front line, make sure he, get, make sure he gets killed. He didn't say that, but that's the deal, right? 
That's verse 6. Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah. Verse 16, you've got to connect them, okay? And I'll be finished. You've got to connect them. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus. How do you explain that? Grace. Grace. Verse 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child. Bring forth a son. And they will call his name Emmanuel, which God may interpret it as God with us. From David's sin we find Jesus in the line so when you read your Bible there's a city named after David right the city of Jerusalem is better known as the city of David Jesus is in heaven right now seated on the throne of David. God knew that David was going to do all this bad stuff, but yet, first of all, he chose a woman in the garden messed us up by eating of the forbidden fruit, right? It was a woman that did that. So God uses a woman to rescue us with a virgin-born Savior. What a wonderful plan when you put it all together. Now, the last word is glorification you got them all sanctification or justifications first sanctification is second glorification hasn't happened yet that's the rapture that's heaven so you won't ever forget this little message and what happens to our sin I didn't want to wear this coat through the service because it's too hot but this is my preaching coat and I need pastor to help me Put my arm up there. When, have you, when you have a stroke and you fall on your arm. There we go. Now. Sin is black. Right? This coat. Represents. my 90,890 sins. I want to show you what happened to them. And if you're here this morning, you're saved, and you're saved. I'm, I asked the pastor, Pastor Frank, to help me with this illustration. And I asked him to play the part of Jesus. I know, I know. I, sh I couldn't find anybody else. <laughs> Could have asked his dad. So he's playing the part of Jesus. And here's what happened. Aug August 14. 
He needs to put on a little weight. <laughs> don't, you, don't you feed your preacher? Jesus took all my sin. That's only half of the story. See, the other half is the part, by, the part I didn't get. And some of you didn't get until this morning. Okay. The whole story is, yeah, he took all my sin. But what I read you from the scripture says he imputed. The imputed righteousness. The word impute means deposit. It's a banking term. Any bankers here? It's a banking term. Impute means to deposit in the account. He imputed to my account his righteousness. So what happened was, no, 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 Jesus has got to do this. No, I'm me. No, no, leave it on. Okay. He took my sin. And he gave me his righteousness. Amen. When God looks at me, he looks through his son who bore my sin, and he sees me with the righteousness of his son. Amen. And this morning, that's what God will do for you. If you're here and you have not accepted Jesus, today's the moment. Today's the time. Pastor, you can take that sin cut off. Jesus is in heaven now. Sitting on the throne of David. A picture of God's marvelous grace. And in Revelation chapter 21, and this, I'm going to close again. This will be my third closing, okay? <laughs> I'm, I'm like the pilot. I'm looking for a place to land, okay, the plane. This is so good. But in Revelation chapter 21, I want to read two verses and I'm done. Remember I said we're waiting for glorification? Justification is in the past. Sanctification is happening now. And glorification is yet to come. And here in Revelation chapter 21, and we'll close. In verse 2, John was given a glimpse of heaven. Okay. And these precious girls over here, and put this verse up on the screen here. John was given a view of heaven. And this is what he saw. It says, verse, verse 1, I saw a new heaven, new earth. The first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Verse 2, Behold, and I, John, saw the holy city, 
New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, The tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they'll be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And I love this verse, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. And we're going to end with this. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there will be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. I was thinking one day, what does it mean? What, is, what are those former things? And I got my pen out. I was by myself. My wife had gone to work. And Ryan was off to college a couple weeks ago. Months ago. And I was reading that scripture and those two words popped out. Former things. John said, the former things are going to pass away. So I, I, started, I started writing stuff down. Former things. Can I read them for you and then we'll close? Former things. Loneliness. COVID. Masks. Former things, addictions, poverty, crime, hunger, strokes. I think I wrote that one down twice. Sin, tears. Funerals, diabetes, heart attacks, hospitals, cemeteries, wheelchairs, insulin, empty chairs, widows, cancer, former things, blindness, Riots, orphans, war, hospice, asthma, sign language. <laughs> I saw the singers do the sign language. Sorry, there won't be no sign language in heaven. Amen? No sign language. Thank God for it here. I, I love the... Well, I always, always watch them because when it comes to Jesus, you know what the sign is. The nail print. Former things. Police. Robbery. Prison. Dentist. Colonoscopies. glorification if you're here this morning and you want to walk out of here with everything I talked to you about this morning justified start a new life of sanctification of hope of someday glorification and being with Jesus where all the former things are gone it all starts at the cross. Heads bowed, eyes are closed. Pastor, come if you would.